Chapter 14 The Demons The speed at which the world zipped by the locomotive's windows belied the train's smooth glide. Callie knew better than to question the idiosyncrasies of her dreams, but the experience left her curious as to whether riding on a train truly felt like being whisked away on the wind. She felt two sizes too small next to the other passengers, which remained a consistency in every dream. Standing on her seat only allowed her to peek out the window of the train at a blurry, lush landscape. Something was different about the cabin this time. The faces of the other passengers remained blurred, but other details beckoned for her attention. A pattern comprised of crisscrossing diamonds was etched into the ceiling, and the carpet below mirrored the design in ornate threads of gold and maroon. She tried to recall the paintings on the Kingfisher, wondering if perhaps one of the works of art lining its halls might have spurred a deeper level of imaginative detail. A giant man in a dull gray uniform walked up to her seat. The man was the only one whose face wasn't obscured. His expression remained sad yet kind, and his smile flared out his mustache in the way it always did in her dream. However, when he spoke, Callie couldn't understand his gibberish. Could you maybe write down what you're saying? Callie asked. She had never thought to go that route before. The muddled voice of the caring man accompanied a bewildered expression. He patted Callie on the head with a large hand, then moved on to speak with other passengers. Callie looked back out of the window at the green scenery. Suddenly, all went dark. Callie opened her eyes. The world was a blur, but the familiar wooden ceiling coming into focus told her that she was still in the captain's quarters of the Brass Fox. Absolved of her headaches, she tried to sit up but found herself mildly restrained by the bedsheets. An absence of light from the porthole let her know she hadn't slept through the night. She was still fully dressed except for her jacket and boots, but there was no sign of Rass anywhere. Peeling away the sheets, she swung her feet over the side of the bed, connecting with something decidedly not the floor, as floors didn't say, ow. Callie jerked her legs up, sliding them back onto the bed. From the floor, she heard a man's voice groan. Rass? You're up, he croaked. How's your head? The question was flat and lifeless, as if Rask had asked it more out of duty than anything else. She peeked over the edge of the bed, looked down at Rask, and then glanced over to the table in the middle of the room. His letter sat out in the open. I'm all right now. It kind of came out of nowhere again, she said, trying desperately to maintain some degree of nonchalance. Rask got up and wordlessly made his way over to the chair where his jacket was draped. He grabbed it, slung it over his shoulder, then turned to exit. When you're ready, we could use a heading, he said curtly. Callie began to speak, but the slamming door stopped her. The brass fox slid above the starlit bathed cloud layer, its balloon peeking out first, then its whole body. Up on the bridge, Rass worked the controls using more force than necessary to restart the working engine, then half-folded, half-crumpled his star map. He heard noises from the captain's quarters and assumed Callie was moving about. First shuffles, then clanking sounds. An hour passed before the quarters door opened and Rass watched Callie as she made her way up to the bridge. Where are we? Callie asked, beginning with a safe topic. Dixie peeked her head up from the hold before climbing onto the deck. Oh, look, he's finally awake. Evidently, the collective has the same idea as you guys and headed east while we were aboard. Are you feeling any better? Uh, a little, thanks, Callie said. How much time does that save us? Shame the question more at Rath than Dixie. At least a day, Dixie said, allowing Rath to continue to respite from speaking, assuming they were headed in the right direction. We passed Solaria, Rath said quietly. Callie leaned in and whispered, Can we please talk? Rath watched Dixie watch him and Callie. Just let me know when you get a heading, he said. I thought we were going to pick up parts in Solaria, Callie said. What happened to that plan? Solaria isn't where we thought it would be, Dixie said. We checked. It must have moved before it crashed, and we don't have time to go searching for it, Rass said. We'll have to limp around the wild as best we can. But we're a day closer than we thought, so that's good, right? Why did you read my letter? Rass asked, his tone harsher than he had intended. Callie stood stunned for a moment. I was just cleaning up the cabin and I accidentally saw part of it. Then you accidentally saw all of it? Rass asked, hurt. I'm sorry, I had to know. Nixie raised a hand. Can I interject? Not now, Dixie, Rass said. He turned back to Callie. What? You had to know that I'm a lack? His eyes welled up. That I'm practically wired to make life harder for others? That's not true. Who don't I make things harder for? Guys, Dixie asked. What? Rass shouted. Now might not be the best time, but I was thinking it worthwhile to mention that we're sinking. Just saying. Dixie pointed down to the hold. Maybe I should go check on the engine? She asked as the clouds began to spill over the railing. It dawned on Rass that the silence of the night had come at the expense of the other working windstrider. He flipped the switch to restart the engine, but nothing happened. Me, Callie said. You don't make things harder for me. I've had a theory for a long, long time, and the letter confirmed it. You thought I was a lack, too? He asked. The instrument panel noted that the scoop wasn't taking in any energy and automatically shut down to avoid damaging itself. He lowered the collection tube and the sensor indicated a level 3 potency. No, think about it, Rass. Have you ever seen me with a headache? 
The ship shifted to port, and their descent quickened to a pace that promised an unpleasant and hull-damaging landing. It was too late to engage the Helios engine since they were no longer above the clouds. It was a perfectly acceptable time to panic. Cut the ballast. We're sinking, Rash shouted. He couldn't see Dixie, but he could hear her swearing a blue streak. Maybe the headaches come because I can't escape time, Callie said. Maybe you keep me from overloading by dulling that sensitivity. As they cleared the cloud layer, Rass saw her beginning to tear up. And I'm sorry that you're stuck with me. He didn't have time to mull over a lifetime of memories to weigh against her theory, but he needed Callie to keep a level head. Callie, I've never considered myself stuck with you, but if we don't offload enough weight, we're going to be stuck without a ship. Rass dashed over to the side of the railing with the nearest ballast bags. We can talk about this after we don't crash. Deal? He fumbled with the rope, untying it as Dixie and Callie moved to other bags and did the same. As the weights dropped, the brass fox descent didn't slow noticeably. They needed to drop something far heavier. Open the bay! Dixie shouted, and without much time to question why, Rass obliged, running back up to the console and jammed the new button Tibbs installed. He looked up to see a frightened Callie and no sign of Dixie. The whinnying of an unfamiliar engine trying to cycle from beneath the deck caught his attention. Dixie! Rass shouted. The howl of the wind flowing in the direction from the hole drowned out his voice. Callie, tell her it's not ready. What? Callie shouted back. The jet cycle isn't ready. Tell her to dump it. Rass mimed a pushing motion. Kelly nodded, then descended into the hold as Rass did his best at the helm to stave off the descent by redirecting the collection hose and expelling the air in the tank. The roar of an engine cut through the wailing wind and disappeared with a quickly fading exclamation of joy or despair as the brass fox descent tapered to a glide. Dixie, you did it! Rass shouted with no response. With both engines dead and the Helios engine in danger of overloading underneath the clouds, the ship sat eerily silent save for the usual creak of wooden rope. Callie? Callie climbed from the hole to the deck, her expression blank. It worked, Rass said. We're not falling nearly as much. She dumped the jet cycle. I suppose that's better than losing the fox. She was still on it. Rass's eyes hurt from squinting, trying to make out movement in the inky night after his knack visions gave no indication of anything energy fueled beneath them. Maybe she got it working before it crashed? Callie asked. Rass shook his head. She'd have flown back up here if she did. We should at least look for her when we touch down. Maybe the tree softened the fall enough. The thought of what they might find disturbed Rass. He nodded and trudged back up to the helm to steady the ship's slow and graceful descent. The sun began to peek over the horizon, lending a bit of light to the world, and Rass could see they were floating high above a dense forest outside of a town built around something chillingly familiar. I think we found Solaria, Rass said. Aside from some superficial architectural differences, the crash structure reminded Rass of Verdant, giving him a glimpse of his city's grim future. Torches! Callie said, pointing down. Beneath them, a moving line of two dozen twinkling lights blinked through the dense foliage. Maybe they'll help her if she survived. They're probably remnants, Rass said, searching for a clearing big enough to land the ship. In a matter of minutes, the brass fox settled neatly into a nearby clearing. Rass lowered the anchor out of habit as though the ship might somehow take off without them. Callie packed the leather satchel with provisions while Rass holstered his large wrench and strapped on the grapple gun, thinking it wise to bring even though they had no places from which to fall. With a general idea of the direction of where they needed to go, Rass stepped off the gangplank and shortly realized he heard only one set of footfalls. He turned and saw Callie standing on the edge of the gangplank, satchel strapped across her body. If we're gonna find her before the remnants do, we're gonna have to hurry, Rass said. It's just... Callie began. I've never touched the ground before. She gently lowered one foot forward to the grass. She tentatively shifted her weight, then took a few experimental steps, unsure of the new sensation. It doesn't move. Rass nodded before turning around to head back into the woods. An hour of trudging through the forest only offered up the clue of a scraped chunk of metal that Rass recognized as part of the jet cycle. We can't do this all day. Maybe she made it into the town, Rass said. But what if she's still out here and we gave up on her? Callie said. Dixie! She shouted, cupping her hands to her mouth. Shh, what if remnants hear you? Callie sighed, looked about, and continued walking. Just ten more minutes. Rass wanted to protest. He wanted a reminder that Verdon was still sinking as they searched, and he had no idea how they were going to avoid remnants, find Dixie, and fix their engines. And even if they were to successfully make it into the wild, they still had elders to dodge and a return trip filled with most of the same obstacles to navigate. Rass. Callie crouched about fifty feet ahead, inspecting something. He quickly closed the distance and saw what interested her. Blood. Formerly white strains of hair lay matted in the small pool. Nearby, multiple sets of tracks headed off in the direction of the town. I don't know why they'd take a dead body. Maybe this is a good thing? Rass asked. According to Dixie's theories, he actually had several gruesome ideas as to why they might take a dead body, but didn't feel an opportune time to share. We're too late, Kelly said, looking up to Rass, then past him. Wait, maybe not. Rass turned to see what she was looking at. The jet cycle hung lodged high between a couple of close-growing trees. Still... It would have been a long way to fall. 
There's no way I'm getting up there without that thing falling down on me, he said. Twenty minutes later and fifty feet higher, Rass was peeking out between green leaves for the first time in his life. Naturally, at some point his mind had decided that standing on the swaying branches was a sufficient novel sensation to deserve an attack of the vertigo. He looked down at Callie, who stood near the base of the trees, and immediately regretted it. I'd stand back. No sense in both of us getting crushed if we can help it. She obliged. Merely five feet away from the jet cycle, Rass lacked an actual plan of how to get the thing started. He imagined getting the machine to run, only to crane into another tree moments later. On the other hand, if the plan worked, they might have a chance of getting to the town before the torchlit party. The awkward position of the jet cycle caused Rass to wonder about the merits of trying to start the machine while sideways to let the engine cycle. Letting the bike fall would almost ensure its inoperability, a state that Rass didn't wish to share by riding it straight down to the forest floor. Climbing the last five feet, he pulled within grabbing distance of the right handlebar. The key was still in the ignition. Will it work? Callie called up. Rass looked down to respond and immediately tightened his grip on the branch, shutting his eyes tightly. Don't know yet. Retrieving the wrench from his holster, he used it to press the ignition button. The engine cycled, but didn't start. He pressed the button again to the same effect. The sound reminded him of whenever the fox's engine scoop would clog. But with the intake on the bottom of the jet cycle, Rass realized he had climbed the wrong tree to access the guts of the vehicle. After one last fruitless push of the ignition button to remind him that luck was usually not on his side, he climbed a bit higher than the jet cycle. The other tree offered a few branches to grasp, but none that looked likely to support his weight. He set a foot lightly down on the side of the jet cycle seat. It shifted slightly, but settled. He didn't know if Dixie could have survived a drop from this height, but if she did, she'd be showing meetings with every branch below, of which there were many. Rass placed more of his weight onto the jet cycle, which now felt firmly lodged. He took a deep breath and pulled himself toward the opposite tree as the jet cycle rumbled to life beneath him. No, not now. Rass scolded the machine, but like a disobedient child, it throttled harder, shooting steam out behind it as Rass lunged for the controls. The jet cycle shot free of its wooden prison, and Callie gave a yelp of surprise as it came careening down straight for her. Rass grasped the left handlebar, pulling it back toward himself to alter the jet cycle's course. This also righted the vehicle, causing Rass to no longer be atop it but dangle from the handlebar as the jet cycle picked up speed and leveled off just above Callie. The sudden jerk upward caused Rass to lose his grasp, and he spun like a ragdoll until he met the ground, painfully. The bike zipped off in the distance. Callie came rushing to Rass's side. Are you all right? She felt around, looking for any obvious wounds. Anything broken? I got it out of the tree. Yay, Rass said flatly. He groaned. I do entirely. Too much falling. I was meaning to talk to you about that. Callie smiled slightly as she brushed some of Rass's hair out of his eyes, revealing a scrape to his left cheek. Suddenly, Rass no longer minded falling so much. Where's the jet cycle? He tried to look around, but the pain persuaded him to leave that to Callie. Callie surveyed the area. That's funny. I could stand to hear something funny. The jet cycle. It stopped. Callie stood, leaving Rass. Rass fought to pull himself up to a seated position, but failed. His outfit was covered in leaves and dirt, and the nicks and cuts would soon be accented with bruises. He felt mostly unharmed, but experience taught him it was just the adrenaline. Rolling over to his side, he could see the jet cycle had come to a rest mostly unscathed in a nearby clearing. Its engine softly puttered as though inviting them to come play. Carefully picking himself up, he approached the jet cycle. Do you remember which way the torches went? Rass asked as he slowly swung his leg over it, hugging the wide body for a respite. Callie climbed behind him, pointing slightly to the left before gingerly wrapping her arms around his midsection. Too tight? His head shook a negative, although the tender ribs screamed otherwise at him. Can't have you fallen off. He gunned the throttle and off they went. Zipping through the forest on the jet cycle was far more manageable than he had expected. After only a few close calls with the low-hanging branches, Rass gained a feel for flying the persnickety vehicle. Judging by the speedometer, they were heading at a good clip toward the town. Callie kept an eye out for Dixie or any party of travelers that might have collected her, allowing Rass to focus on not killing them both. Dixie was nowhere to be seen, but keeping an eye on the tracks at that speed was near impossible. Within twenty minutes, they reached the edge of the forest and disembarked, covering the jet cycle with a mix of shrubs and down branches which did little more than make it obvious that something was hidden underneath. The town itself was surrounded by a dozen metal obelisks. The structures towered several hundred feet high. Did remnants build these? Rass asked. Cal shook her head. They're older than the Atmo project. Helios invented pylons to keep the city safe, Callie said, nearing the tower and inclining her ear to the hum and crackle emanating from it. It's still active. What are you talking about? This was a stopgap solution after the Max blew, she said. Energy can't pass in or out of these fields. It kept people safe inside from convergences. How did people travel between cities? Rass asked. They didn't. The field would detonate an act passing through. Nobody wanted to find out if they were a candidate for joining a convergence, Callie said. Hence the Atmo project. Exactly, she said. I just wish I knew what town this was. So remnants won't be inside, right? Rass asked. Not unless they're willing to risk blowing up. 
Suddenly this town seems a lot more appealing. But that means Dixie won't be inside, Kelly said. We'll cover a lot more ground with a working ship, he said and walked up to the crackling pillar. What if it doesn't discriminate between energy and time next? Callie asked. I didn't bring Hal's sphere. I'm pretty sure I don't actually need that to move around if you overload, Rest said. It's probably the only useful side effect of being a lack. He walked past the pillar casually and turned to see Callie still standing on the other side. Don't call yourself that. You're special. You've always taken my headaches away. I just never told you because I didn't want you to feel pressured into being near me all the time. She met his eye. I don't want you to feel obligated. I promised I'd keep you safe. I made you promise. I could have said no, Rass said. Would you have said no if you knew what we were? And what exactly are we? A match set? Rass smiled. I guess I thought that before we left Verdant. A pause. He walked past the pillar again to Callie and offered his hand. She placed her small hand in his and stood near him. Inhaling sharply, she began walking forward with her breath held. As they passed through the field together, Rass felt tingles coursing through his body that he hadn't felt when passing through alone. A quick expulsion of air from Callie panicked Rass until the laughter tickled his ears. He looked over to her and began laughing heartily, as Callie's red hair was standing on end in every direction. Rass tried to stop landing. I'm sorry, but your hair... My hair? Your hair? She said, trying to smooth out her own mane. Rass patted his head to find that going through the gate with her left him with the same treatment. It didn't do that the first time. The laughing hurt, but oddly enough, Rass appreciated the moment of levity for it. The laughter died down, and Rass and Callie just smiled at each other. She quirked her mouth and squeezed it hand gently. I'm sorry I read your letter, she said. It's all right, Rass said. He loosened his grip on her hand, but it remained attached to his. He looked down at their clasped hands. We're through the field now. You know you don't have to keep holding my hand. Right, but we're also closer to the wild. The headaches start faster if I get too far away from you, Callie said. Rass fought disappointment. Well, squeeze tight if you see anything. They continued down the broken road passing grown-over farms along the way before reaching the wreckage of the crumbled city. Half-fallen buildings lined the path, their debris strewn everywhere. A large sign, faded from time and neglect, welcomed and warned them. It read, The Township of Bogues. Now might be a really good time to tell me what was in the Demons of Bogues, Rass said. Not elders. I skimmed it, Callie said, a smile growing. I don't even know where to begin. What now? Rass... The first convergence was either made here or came here after the Battle of Bogues. Look, she said, pointing past the decrepit buildings to a more modest set of thatch roofed cottages. They rebuilt after the Great Overload. But Bogues wasn't one of Atmos' 21 cities, Rass said. So what happened to the people that stayed inside the pylons? Callie stopped, jerking Rass's arm back. Then people might be in those cottages, she held a hand over her mouth. And they might know what happened. And they might be inbred cannibals. That's hardly a sustainable system, Callie said. I can't imagine a flying city falling on them left a sizable population, Rass said. How about if we see someone and they don't look like they want to eat us, we'll stop and chat? As they continued down the path, the fallen city loomed larger, canted at a slight angle. Can we at least check inside one of the huts? Rass took a deep breath. Real quick. He drew his wrench from his holster and they approached one of the small buildings. The cottages pocked the land in no particular pattern and looked unkempt as far as Rass could discern. Callie stepped up to the door and raised her hand to knock before looking at Rass, then the wrench. Let's not scare them. I think strangers talking outside their front door already takes care of that, Rass said. He holstered the wrench and gestured for Callie to continue. Upon Callie's first knock, the flimsy wooden door creaked open. Callie peeked her head in, then recoiled back with a wretch before falling to her hands and knees away from the door. What is it? Rass asked before he saw the remains inside. Oh. With a foot, he pushed the door further open, shining daylight on a family of skeletons in tattered clothing. I'm sorry, Callie said, reaching for Rass to help her up. Rass held her close and quickly walked away from the cottage. I'm no doctor, but I'm going to say they're dead. She pulled away. Rass, those were people with families and stories, and... She sighed. And now they're going to be in my nightmares, and I'm never going to find out why the overload happened. She fought her irregular breathing with a quick inhale. Let's just get the parts. Standing under the shadow of the crashed city's lip, Rass estimated the crater left at least 30 sublevels exposed. A shelf eight feet above them held an open door that looked promising. I'll give you a leg up, Rass said, squatting down for Callie to step on his thigh. She steadied herself on some exposed pipe, and as soon as she no longer needed his support, he climbed up the wrecked machinery to the ledge. Pulling himself up next to Callie, he rested for a moment. Are you all right to go in? As I'll ever be she said before disappearing into the black maw of the doorway. 
The light only reached in so far, and after a minute they needed to open their eyes as much as possible to see anything. New rule. Always bring a flashlight, Callie said. Good rule, Rass said, using the wall to half support himself along the angled hallway. So, where's the most likely place to find what we need? Up top in the abandoned city? Callie asked hopefully. I wish. Any engine parts are going to be salvaged from below. He patted the wall, causing a metallic echo. In the distance, a small green light grew, illuminating the long corridor. They froze. It faded, then pulsed back, continually repeating the pattern. Emergency system. We must have trimmed a sensor, said Rass. You say that like it's a good thing. Seeing our way around is usually a positive. The dead city unnerved Rass more than he was willing to admit. It was one thing to compare the fallen city to Verdant from the outside, but another thing entirely to have an identical interior. For all the familiarity of the engine garnered from his short stint in Verdant's underbelly, he might as well have been walking in the dead halls of his hometown. But if this place still has emergency systems, that still has scoops. They came into a fork in the corridor, and Rass instinctively chose the left path, which pointed slightly downward. So if the demon's bogues didn't have elders in it, what did it have? The usual. The boogeyman under the bed with green eyes at eight children if they didn't sing the right song, Callie said. How did the song go? I didn't memorize it. Oh, don't give me that, Rass said with a chuckle. You memorize practically everything. I really don't feel like singing right now. They approached an old elevator shaft. Green lights blinked down it, lighting it enough to show that if it had been vertical, it would have been a good 300-foot drop. Thankfully, it sat at an angle that would have made for the biggest playground slide ever. Rass swapped out the grapple spike with a magnet charge on his grapple gun, then placed the magnet against the wall next to the elevator entrance instead of firing a charge. He spooled out some thick cable and tested his weight against it. The quality was far superior to anything he had ever stocked the grappler with before. Mr. Helios doesn't skimp on displays, he muttered to himself. He looked up at Callie. Climb onto my back. It'll hold two of us? More than that. Not all wind merchants make exercise a priority. He turned for her to ease onto his back. She stood on her tiptoes and wrapped her arms tightly around his neck, her breath warm against his skin. Ready. He swung out into the empty shaft, and one foot after the other slowly began his descent alongside a long set of metal rungs. They looked to be a feasible alternative to the grapple gun, but Rass preferred to have a cable as a lifeline and a means to haul up parts. A few odd noises clanked about high above them. Rass glanced up to see that the shaft went up at least another fifty stories. Emergency system, right? Callie asked, tightening her grip ever so slightly. Yeah. They came to another open elevator doorway one floor down. Hang on. Rass swung to the side a little, walking alongside the open entrance. In the corner of his eye, he saw a blur of motion in the corridor as they descended. He decided it was just his fear playing tricks on his eyes and put it out of his mind until Callie's arm tightened to a chokehold. Rass! I saw it, he said. It? Them? She pointed upward. Pairs of glowing green eyes stared at them from the open elevator door shafts, including the one they had just entered. There were dozens of glowing sets of eyes, with more appearing by the moment from above and below. Please don't hurt us. Callie said. The eyes merely watched. The cable began vibrating, alerting Rast to a creature above them that was starting to use some sort of tool on their cable. No, 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 no. Let's, let's talk this out, huh? Rast called up. It continued hacking at the cable. Callie, I'm going to swing us over to the rungs. The cable snapped, sending them sliding down the wall of the shaft at an alarming rate. Callie's screams pierced Rass's ears, making it difficult to focus. The rungs along the wall and the shaft sped by, and he made a grab for one but accomplished little more than repeatedly bashing his hand. Rass passed by a dozen or so elevator entrances before he looked down to see less than a dozen left before they would meet some nasty-looking machinery waiting to stop their fall. He tried to maneuver his right hand over to load another grapple charge, but in the process accidentally knocked his elbow into another set of rungs. The continuing slide caused his stomach and thighs to burn madly from the friction. Another doorway flew by. Seconds left. Rass twisted his body, pulling Callie above him to shield her from the machinery awaiting them below. What are you doing? She said. Just close your eyes, Rass said, embracing her. He didn't know if she would survive, but he would give her the best possible chance. Something pried his left arm off of her, slamming it against the metal shaft so that it screeched a horrific symphony as sparks showered down the hall. His arms and shoulder burned as they dragged along the rough wall. Rass squinted to see what had happened. The placeholders for extra magnets atop the grapple gun, which Rass had never been able to afford to fill, had drawn close enough to the wall to pin his arm against the shaft. The quick shift into momentum left Callie dangling from around his neck, facing him as they continued to crane down level after level. The magnet holder eroded away, slowing their descent until they stopped with just one elevator entrance above the floor. You're smoking, Callie said, arms trembling but still holding tight. Before he could address the friction burns, Rass swung his body as best he could, reaching his right arm over to the set of metal rungs. I think this is your stop, he said. Callie reached over, taking the pressure off of Rass, who focused on prying his right arm free from the grapple gun without falling the remainder of the way. I think I'm stuck, 
Ress said. He noticed a couple of silhouetted figures climbing up from the bottom level to grab Callie. She screamed in surprise and began kicking down, striking one of the figures in the face. One of the glowing green eyes cracked and winked out. Leave her alone, Ras shouted. More green-eyed figures appeared at the open elevator doors above her. Ras worked his wrench free from the holster, tossed it to her, then returned to untying the grapple gun straps. Callie climbed above him. Suddenly, the half-dozen straps that ensured his safety were his prison. Two down, four to go. A loud beeping noise emanated through the shaft as machinery whirred to life all around. The express elevator cables began moving at a rapid rate. Pairs of green eyes disappeared as the hot, dank air moved through the shaft. What is that? Callie asked, watching her pursuers flee back through the open doorway. They're trying to crush us. Ras had the third strap undone and began jerking his arm to save time. He offered his right arm to Callie. Pull me free. She looped an arm through her rung and clasped his hand, then pulled with everything in her. Ras was slowly coming loose from the straps around his elbow when he saw the elevator screaming down at them. They had moments left. Putting his feet up against the wall, he gave one last ditch yank to pull free. Slipping out of the grapple gun, he swung tenuously on Callie's grip as the elevator neared. Ras! He fell the last ten feet, landing hard on his back next to some of the sharp bits of metal. He watched Callie barely dive out of the way of the rushing machine and into the open doors of the bottom floor entrance. As the elevator came down upon him, all went black.